mystery it is, God, that you would create the heavens and the earth and infinite, un unimaginable power, and yet and you love us, you call us, you're willing to work with us, you call us friends, your sons and daughters. Um, God, we thank you for this privilege, Lord, help us to understand more and uh, to bear fruit to be real before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this time to spend in your presence, and we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, what's up, guys? Hope you had a great week. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, I've entitled the message, Fruit, Not Root. Um, so let's go ahead and start. I'm going to read from us uh, Luke 3, 7 through 18. Uh, so if you'd follow along. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham <clears throat> as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed to you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but, the, but, the, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his uh, granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Amen. Blessed reading of the word. Um, uh, I'm sure I, I'd imagine a lot of you guys would agree with uh, the statement that there are things in life that are unpleasant uh, to experience no matter <laughs> what age you are, how successful or powerful you might be, no matter who you are. Uh, some of these things are like uh, going to the dentist or uh, feeling I'm being left out by friends or maybe catching a cold. Um, I might add to that list uh, for today, experiencing uh, being corrected or rebuked um, or maybe what God would do calling us to repentance. Um, but I just want to remind us today that uh, when God calls us to repentance, that that act in itself is an act of mercy. And um, if he didn't love us, he wouldn't have mercy upon us. Um, and as we learned last week, the true definition or the true meaning of repentance is to have a change of mind, um, to be transformed after being profoundly impacted by who God is. And so therefore, God's call to repentance is to turn away from sin and death and to turn to Him uh, where, where there is eternal life. One thing that I heard my parents say a lot growing up was... Um, which means, uh, yeah, listen to what I'm saying while I'm still asking nicely. <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, my, mom, my mom would always say that with a, kind of like a half smile on her lips. Uh, but the Bible has actually a similar idea that Paul outlines in Rome, Romans. Uh, this comes from chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, which is our key verse for this week. I'll read it for us. Or do you, spy, do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's patience is meant to lead you to repentance? But by your hard and, and penitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And the key thought, therefore, is this, repent while you still have the chance. And the, and, the, and the fact of it is, most of the time when we sin, it's not like God immediately sends a lightning bolt to like punish you like they do in the cartoons. Oftentimes, God will be patient. Um, 
it was a great reminder to myself and to all of you guys that we have to understand that behind God's patience is a desire that we turn from sin and we cannot make the dangerous and foolish assumption the mistake that God's patience is because that he's okay with sin or that he doesn't care about our sin. Um, 2 Peter 3, 9 through 10 talks about God's patience and the reason behind it. Uh, it says this, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. So in that sense, God is slow in returning, not because he doesn't care about what's going on in the world, but he wants as many people as possible to return to him in repentance to be saved. And, in, and it's not that God is okay with the way things are in this world. And he wants people to repent, but repent before it's too late. And certainly there are times when God's patience uh, turns into active rebuke and discipline and it's often, um, you know, not the most pleasant thing to experience. But we have to remind ourselves that this too is an act of love. Another thing I heard a lot growing up was something my dad would say. He's like, like um, I get in trouble or get disciplined or punished or yelled at. And he'd be like, you know, hey, keep in mind that we wouldn't say or do these things to you if we didn't love you. Like the kids down the street, do, we see, do you see us? Um, <clears throat> disciplining them we don't care about them or how they act it's because we love you and uh, I, I had a hard time accepting that but you know it kind of stuck with me and this kind of has a basis in the Bible too uh, Revelation 319 uh, to those whom I love I rebuke and discipline so be earnest and repent uh, this is Jesus speaking to the churches um, the last days and this is the NLT version of Hebrews 12 6 for the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child Deuteronomy 5 8 so in your heart uh, so know in your heart that just as a man disciplines his son so the Lord your God disciplines you in Proverbs 3 12 for the Lord disciplines the one he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. And there's several more in the Bible where there's this common thread of love and care and even the word delight is used um, to talk about how God disciplines us. And so when we're going through corrections or hard times in life, I think it's a very important reminder that uh, we're not too down by it and that to, to somehow stay strong and know that God is not letting you go off into this crazy path uh, because he does love us and uh, there is a plan and yet it can be painful. Um, and that brings us back to the first couple of verses in our passage. I'll read it for us. Uh, again, this is Luke 3. I'm going to read from verse 7 through 9. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, <clears throat> You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits worthy of repentance, not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Now even the acts is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Man, can you imagine coming to church and being greeted like that? Hey, welcome to church, you son of a snake. Um, <laughs> your religion's worthless. Don't, <laughs> you know, it's like, holy moly. Uh, you know, like, change your life or you're going to get thrown into, you know, the fire. You're worthless. Um, man, but that's exactly what he says. Rather, you know, you would think that he would commend the crowds for coming to be baptized, but, the, you know, to drive, to dr not drive, walk all the way, travel all the way out there to listen to his sermon. And John, and he, he, he welcomes them by calling at them out for their hypocrisy, calling them snakes. Um, and he's like, don't be fake. He's like, I want you to actually show change in your life. Bear fruit worthy of something that's actually, you know, so we can call it repentance. And he says, you know, true repentance is what we need. Don't fall back on your Jewish heritage. You know, the Jews back in those days, they had this belief that because they're the son of and daughters of 
Abraham, the, you know, the father of faith, that that was enough to be in good standing. Like they were the chosen ones. And so they really felt like they were favored. And John says, don't even begin to talk about, like, don't even bring that crap up. That's a bunch of bull honky. Like, don't even, don't even talk. Um, he's like, you know what? God can raise up real children through these rocks. Like basically inanimate, worthless objects. He's like, that's, you know, God, if you, you know, you talk about being a child of God, like, he can raise up children through, from these rocks. Don't talk about that. Um, and today, you know what he might say to us is, you know, he might be like, you know, I don't care if your parents are elders or pastors or if your parents are missionaries or I don't care if you grew up in the church and um, you know the Bible. Like if you're not producing the real fruit of real faith and obedience, then you're going to go to hell and God can see right through your hypocrisy. And uh, man, what a... What a wake-up call. What a harsh and um, very direct and, you know, there's no, there's nothing, you know, hidden about that. John just straight up blasts them and tells them exactly the way it is. But sometimes we need that, don't we? And he's not done. He says the axe is lying at the root of the tree. That means the axe hasn't been picked up yet. It's not being chopped yet. But the tree that isn't bearing fruit has been identified, singled out, and chosen. And the axe has been taken out of the shed and take, brought outside and laid down by the tree. So it's just a matter of time. The master of this orchard or garden has already pinpointed which ones need to go, which one is trash and in need of being chopped up and only good for maybe starting a fire. And man, that's, imagine if that's how God sees your life right now, that your religion is worthless to him and he's calling us out for our hypocrisy, being fake. And so I want to talk about his good fruit. It's not talking about how well you sing praise songs or how many Bible verses you memorize. It's about the changes in your life that is a direct result of your faith-driven obedience to God. And I believe that good fruit isn't a perfect life. I think true Christians can, even though they have true repentance, can fall from time to time. Um, but there's, there's a difference between stumbling from time to time versus making a lifestyle out of sin and, and just being okay with it and not trusting God and still being a slave to sin instead of a slave to Christ and righteousness. And in the next section of our passage, we actually uh, show a very re surprising response. I'm going to read us for verses 10 through uh, uh, 14. 10 through 14. Here we go. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threat or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. You know, if they were full of pride, they could have walked away. They could be like, man, screw this guy. I can't believe I came all the way out to the wilderness to listen to this crazy dude who eats grasshoppers and wears camel fur. And he's not even, you know, clean this guy. Who, who does he think he is to say all these things? You know, in this day and age, they would have canceled John the Baptist. They would have called him out for being racist. How dare you bring up our father Abraham? You know, they would have left in a rage tweeting about his offensiveness. And, you know, like they probably would have made a TikTok reaction to his video, uh, to a video of his sermon. Um, that's probably how people nowadays would have reacted. I don't know how you felt in your heart, you know, reading this passage and uh, imagining it that he was saying it to you. And yet we see in the crowd, their response is surprisingly humble. Um, they don't walk away. They're like, all right, well, what should we do then? And maybe it's because John woke him up, you know, scared him. He, he, it hit home, you know, like they imagine the axe being at the root of the trees. And they're like, man, can't live like this. Shoot, you know, we know this is wrong. We got to change. And um, our response to God's rebuke and his correction is really important. It reveals how true we are. It reveals your true colors. I can definitely speak for myself. I, uh, you know, a lot of this sermon is coming from my own heart. Like, man. Um, I have a long ways to go, and when God rebukes or corrects my heart, I, um, I definitely embrace the idea and the message that you got to respond true and, 
be humbled in it and listen. Um, and it's something that we can all grow from. And to do that, we're going to look at uh, the life of Lot. Um, just a little background. He separates from Abraham and in his greed, he chooses to live in what appears to be the best land. And he settles near Sodom and Gomorrah. It doesn't say he goes in there. But we later learn that he ends up inside Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Genesis 19.1, it says that Lot was one of the elders of the city as he sat at the gateway of the city to, to welcome people in. And it's funny how sin is a way of creeping into our lives. And before we know it, we're just completely lost. We don't even know who we are. Um, but fast forward in the story, God decides enough is enough and decides to put an end to uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and the angels, by grace, by the grace of God, go into the city to save Lot and his family. And this was an act of rebuke of God to Lot, but it was also an act of mercy. It was because of um, Abraham's intercession that God's choosing to save Lot. And God was certainly not pleased with Sodom and Gomorrah, and neither with Lot living there. And um, God was warning him, get up and leave. And, you know, that was just as harsh for Lot. He had built a home, a life there, a status in the city. I mean, his two daughters were, you know, engaged to get married. Um, he had his friends, his community. He knew everyone. They knew him, even though that place was messed up beyond imagination. Read your Bibles. Um, but God says, you know what? Leave everything. Just get up and go. You want to you wanna live? Sometimes you just need to make a 180 and get the heck out of wherever you are. Um, that life of sin. And interestingly, uh, if we look at this slide, uh, not this next section, this is uh, Genesis 19. I'm going to read us verse 15 and 16. And we'll see Lot's response to God's act of grace. Uh, when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. The Bible says he lingered. In other translations, it says that he hesitated. Can you imagine, like, God's trying to correct you, and you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I want to repent. I, I don't know if there's really anything wrong. God, are you sure? And so they have to literally force him out. And sometimes God will do that in our lives where you're just such a fool. I'm talking about myself that God just sometimes just waves his hand and makes things happen because you just can't seem to do it. Um, well, let's keep reading. Let's see Lot's next response. Then Lot said to them, please, uh, this is verse 18, No, my lords, indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life, but I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, the city is near enough to flee to and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. So the angels instruct him to go to the mountains right now. And instead, he kind of back talks. He's like, no, I'm going to, some kind of evil is going to overtake me and I'm going to die. And God's like, are you serious? The evil is where you were and to get out of there that I dragged you out so that you don't die. Now you're saying you're going to die if you listen to me. Like, it's so backwards. His mind is so backwashed with so much sin and the way that Sodom and Gomorrah is. And again, read your Bible to see what happened next. But he flees to Zor, uh, which means little. Um, and then uh, his wife turns back and God says, don't look back. Don't look back on your sin. Don't look back on the way you used to live. Keep moving forward. And then she turns into a pillar of salt. She's dead. And then after that, they move out to the mountains. Um, and life continues his lineage by incest and has two grandsons, um, Moab and Ammon, which are basically, they turn out to be the two biggest uh, enemies of uh, the Israelites in their early history. Um, and that's the legacy of Lot. And I think his greatest failure is not that he made mistakes, which he did a lot of, um, but it was his response to God's call of repentance. It was actually God giving him, by his grand mercy, a, a second chance at new life. He could have repented of his ways and maybe even turned back to Abraham and be like, you know, go to the mountains and do what God has you do there, chill out for a minute, and then maybe go back to his uncle 
Abe and have him lead and be that spiritual guide in his life. You know, he lost everything, but I'm sure Abraham would have welcomed him with two arms, but he, he just, he does his own thing. And, um, and we don't even hear about how he died. His life was so just down the drain that all we know is that his legacy is two incest grandsons who grow up to be Moab and Ammon. Um, and the other example we have is King David. Um, this was a man who was uh, the man who was after God's own heart. And King David is certainly a righteous, amazing, amazing man. And he messes up. And the thing about King David is his true character shines even in his, in his sins. And, and God calls him to repentance by the prophet Nathan. He, he outlines his sin before him. You know what his response is? 2 Samuel 12, 13, he says, I have sinned before the Lord. Um, and we know that in the rest of his life, he'd never sinned like that again. I mean, he made more mistakes, but never again did he do something like that. And God uh, saved him and spared his life, um, even though he was the king. You know, the higher, the more, you know, power and more blessing and more like uh, responsibility you have, the, the higher uh, standard God holds you to. And so God definitely punished him and let some consequences of his sin kind of play out. Um, but the point is that David cho truly showed a humble repentance and, and went back to God, you know, just returned to God and lived his life for him the remaining time that he had. And so the question today is, what is your response going to be? Is it going to be like Lot, hesitation, doubt, back talk, maybe even self-justification? Or are you rather humbly bowing before the Lord? You could do that in your private time, in your prayer. You can do that in truly through the posture of your life, in your heart, through your actions. And, um, you know, at the end of our passage, John speaks of the one who is to come to take away the sins of the world. It's one that John is unworthy, whom they thought, the people thought he was Messiah. He's like, bro, I'm not even worthy to do what the lowest of slaves are not even supposed to do, which is untie somebody else's sandals. That's how... This man is the Son of God who die in our place. And because of Jesus, we are called His children. And as long as we can repent, our struggle with sin will just be temporary. And the response will be just, hey, repent, turn around, be disciplined, and do not, you know, uh, get discouraged by it. Come back. But for those of us who refuse to believe, who ride high on our pride, then the consequence of sin will be eternal and we will die forever in our own um, eternal death and separation from God. And so the reason I entitled the word fruit, not root, is, you know, when we truly repent, we change and we, you know, we bear fruit. Uh, but the root was speaking of how, you know, John said, hey, don't even call yourself children of Abraham. Like they're looking to their heritage. So they're doing, trying to find some other reason or John is assuming that in their minds they're looking for a different uh, way out. Like John's like, bro, the only way out is to repent. And then he's like, but I know what you're thinking. You're like, I don't need to repent. Like I don't. I, I'm saved by some other way, my heritage. And for us today, it might be not be your heritage, but there's all always a different way that we want to think to get out of it. And really, the only way is repentance. And so instead of looking for some other type of self justification. We know that Christ is the only form of justification that we can put our hope in. And so let's return to it, brothers and sisters, this week um, to repent while we still have the chance. Um, anyways, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for every opportunity to repent and to be, um, to be corrected and rebuked and to be disciplined, even punished, Father. And Father, I pray that we would not be too brought down by it uh, that it would do what we, it needs to do. And I don't believe that we should be depressed and so um, destroyed that we cannot even function, but, but we, to remember that you discipline the ones you love and that you mean for, it our, for our good. Um, so may we be encouraged, remember that you are loving and that uh, though the, the night may last for a moment, there's, uh, there's joy and praise in the morning, God. And rejoicing father i pray that we would wait for that day that we would truly turn and not be like lot god but be like king david father we thank you and we pray this in your name amen
All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. I hope you have a great week, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.